Olin, and salutations to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. It's 3 a.m. in the morning here on the 30th of August, 2021. And I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about something in my book, not in his image, which I consider to be of exceptional importance. So September 18th is the release date of the 15th anniversary edition. And if you intend to order it and you wouldn't mind pre-ordering it since it's coming out in about three weeks, that would be helpful to me. If Amazon receives 400 pre-orders, they put the book into another category. They apply different algorithms to it and that promotes the book. So I'd be grateful if you did that, if you were inclined to use Amazon to purchase this book. Those of you in America can also acquire the book directly from my publisher, Chelsea Green. Also, it may be possible that some of you go into a bookstore now and then. I don't know, does this ever happen anymore? I myself must confess that I haven't gone into a bookstore for many, many years. I think the last time I went into a bookstore was in London a long time ago. But if there is a bookstore that you go to and you can physically go in there and order the book through the bookstore, I would prefer that you do that rather than order it through Amazon. Of course, there is a dependence on Amazon for many things in the world today, unfortunately. And if that's the only way you can get it, well, so be it. Those of you who have read the original edition will know that I tackle quite a few difficult subjects in my book. And I consider one of those subjects to be of particular importance at this moment in human history. I can tell you it's a subject that I've struggled with, and I haven't been totally satisfied at moments with how I handled it. But nonetheless, I have done my best to sort out the problem which I define as the deceit of Christ. So what do I mean when I say the deceit of Christ? Now, in the 15th anniversary edition, I doubled down on that issue. I said quite a lot about it in the original edition. But now I go, I believe I go, I intended to go even more to the core of that issue. So let it be clear at the outset that I am not a big fan of Christ or Jesus Christ or Christianity. I make no bones about that. You know exactly where I'm coming from, from the first moment that you hear me say anything about that topic or from the first moment that you read about it in my book. And I realize, of course, that that may be extremely off-putting to some people. There are untold numbers of people around the world who attach enormous importance to the figure of Christ, the teachings of Jesus, the divine human hybrid of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Christ for the salvation of humanity, and yada, yada, yada. And those issues all cluster together in an enormous complex, and they are extremely important in the spiritual and religious life of millions 
upon millions of people around the world. And I make it clear that I stand completely against Christ. But what do I mean when I say that? On what grounds do I say that? And what on earth do I intend to achieve by taking that position? The position of a heretic. Well, I'd like to go to the core of the problem. I consider it a problem. And at the end of this talk, you'll know exactly why. So I can tell you at the outset that the deceit of Christ has two features or two faces. One face is a formula of identity. And the other face or aspect is a formula of ideology. So in standing against Christ and whatever Christ represents, that entire constellation, including the so-called teachings of Jesus, I am standing against a formula of identity and a formula of ideology. Clear enough? So let's look first at the formula of identity. In order to decode and deconstruct the Christ concept, you go back to its origins. And its origins can be found in the Old Testament of the Bible and in another form in the New Testament. But when you go and look for Christ in the Old Testament, of course, it's not there because the word, the title, the designation Christ or the anointed was only introduced in the New Testament. So it raises the question, if in some manner the Old Testament and the New are unity, where do you find Christ in the Old Testament? Now there are websites on the internet where you can do a Bible search and you can do it in English and some sites will give you access to 20 or more translations of the Old Testament. And you can also look at the Hebrew English interlinear. You can see the original Hebrew and you can search that text for the word Christ, and of course you won't find it. But what about the Hebrew word that is equivalent to Christ? You see, Christ is a Greek word from the verb kain, which means to anoint. So it's a title, not a name. Christ is the anointed one. Fine. Now that you know that, you know what the designation of Messiah means. It is also a Hebrew word, which means anointed. So go to one of those Bible word search sites and put in Messiah and search the Old Testament. And guess what? You won't find very much at all. Hardly anything at all. In fact, it appears that the Hebrew equivalent of Christ, which is the Messiah in Hebrew, whatever the pronunciation, appears to show up for the first time and the only time in two verses of the book of Daniel. Now that's rather remarkable, isn't it? I mean, if you know anything about the religion of Judaism, you must know that the figure of the Messiah is of paramount importance. And yet in the Old Testament, you don't hardly, you hardly find it mentioned. The passages in Daniel are somewhat prophetic. Daniel is a prophetic book, 
in the Old Testament. And what those two passages say, basically, is that there is predicted to be a period of time between the moment when the temple in Jerusalem is reconstructed and the coming of the Messiah. And the word Messiah does appear in Hebrew in those two verses, and that's it. This is odd. I mean, just think about this for a moment. It is unquestionable that the figure of the Messiah plays a huge role in Judaism. And yet, it doesn't appear in the textual evidence of the Old Testament. Something to think about. Of course, you may object that there is a translation problem. Well, as I said, one of the search engines that I use on the internet will give you more than 20 translations of the Old Testament. And when you search the word in those 20 translations, it doesn't show up except in the passages that I have mentioned here. Now, I'm not going to go into a long exposition of the figure of the Messiah in Judaism. I've done that in Not in His Image, and you can read all about it. I go right to the origins, and I explain how the messianic concept and the messianic identity emerged among the ancient Hebrews. In particular, at a moment when the first king of Israel was anointed. So the first king of Israel, of the Israelite nation at that time, was anointed and therefore was at that time in that setting the Messiah of the Hebrew people. I explain this at great length and not in his image. And I point out the significant fact that in order to know who the Messiah is, who the anointed one is, you need to know who does the anointing. Now fast forward to the New Testament. Now in the New Testament, there is absolutely no question about the identity of the Messiah. The word occurs frequently in the New Testament, in Greek, so you'll find the Greek word for the Messiah, Christos, which is not a name of a person, but it's a title, the Anointed One. So anyone can use these biblical search engines, and if you want to be really fancy, you can go to Strong's Concordance, and there you will find a detailed list of every instance of the word Christos in the New Testament, the variations of the way that it's spelled, and the connotations and context of its use. Now, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to do that. On the other hand, someone might say, well, if you're not a biblical scholar, and if you're not deeply versed in theology and the history of the Christian religion, you have no business poking around like this. But the fact of the matter is, my friends, that these are the words that the experts use. These are the words that the priests and bishops and historians of religion use. And no matter how they use them, knowing where these words were originally used can be of value to you because you can see that no matter how they interpret the word Christos Messiah in the New Testament, you can see exactly what they base their interpretation upon. And then you can think it through for yourself. If you do so, you will come to the obvious conclusion that the New Testament states explicitly that someone called Jesus or Yeshua born at a certain historical moment in time, agreed to be 
about 2,000 years ago, is the Christos, is the Messiah. Now think about that for a moment. You see, it's a formula of identity, isn't it? There was a man, a living man, a flesh and blood human being, born at a certain time and place, and he had a name in the language of his race. And what was his race, by the way? Well, I'll let you investigate that. And in the language of his race, Yeshua was a man with a name. But he wasn't just any ordinary man. As the New Testament tells you, he was the Christ. He was a divine human hybrid, Jesus Christ. Now, when you know that, which any one of mediocre intelligence can discover, then you know the answer to this question. Who invented Christ in the first place? And the answer is, in the New Testament, in the books of Paul. Paul the Apostle, who was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. But when he was converted, he changed his name. This often happens in cult recruitment situations. And he became the famous Apostle Paul. And he is really the one who invented the identity of the divine human hybrid. You see? So it originates somewhere. It didn't just drop out of the sky. It didn't just crawl out from under a rock like a cockroach, someone invented it in a particular time and place with particular intentions. So when I talk about the formula of identity, that's what I'm talking about. You can go right to the source yourself, and you can see where this formula of identity originated. Now I realize that my use of that expression, who invented Christ, could be offensive to some people. But I'm simply being direct and reasonable. And if you look at that question for a moment, you can easily see that it breaks down into two parts. One part concerns the historical identity of a man living in Palestine 2,000 years ago, and the other concerns the divine status attributed to that identity. So, most Christians who take the Bible literally as the revealed word of God or as an accurate historical record of events in the time of Jesus believe that there was a man, Yeshua, of a certain tribal or ethnic strain, didn't come out of nowhere, he wasn't neutral, he had a racial ancestry, and they believe that that man was a really special and unique case of all people, of all humans ever born on this planet. But look at that claim for a moment. What does that claim actually ask you to believe? Well, it asks you to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin birth, that he, he had a human mother, Mary, who was of a racial or ethnic identity, but he really had no human father. The Holy Ghost was his father. Some supernatural invisible spirit was his father, well, if that's so, and many Christians believe that, then why don't you take the opportunity the next time you talk to a Christian who believes that to ask them, well, if that's true of Jesus, is it also true of Thomas? And they might look at you in a puzzled way and say, well, what do you mean, Thomas? And you could respond by saying, well, the New Testament describes clearly 
that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had other children. So Jesus had brothers. And the New Testament also describes explicitly that Jesus was a twin. And his twin brother was Thomas. So how can it be that a virgin birth coming from the womb of a certain woman produces twins, Jesus and Thomas, but only one of them has the status of being the Christ. You've got to wonder how many self-professed Christians on this planet have even asked themselves that question. Do they even know the narrative of the Gospels well enough to know that the Gospels explicitly say that Thomas was the twin of Jesus. Funny thing about Christianity when you compare it to Islam, one of the fundamental rules of Islam, by the way, they both derive from the root of the Abrahamic religions, which is Judaism. So they're simply different versions of Judaism. But one of the fundamental contrasts, which is also a similarity, between Christianity in, and Islam is that Islam, in the first sentence of the Quran, dictates to believers that they must not question anything in the doctrine of Islam. So, Muslims are not allowed to question anything in their holy scripture. And Christians who are free to question their Holy Scripture, are often so ignorant about it that they cannot even frame an intelligent question. And that's an intelligent question. How can it be that Mary gave birth to twins, Yeshua and Thomas, but only one of them is the Christ? Well, they might answer it in this way. They might say, well, the Christ came upon Jesus at the baptism in the Jordan by John the Baptist. Now, that's a fair argument based more or less on the narrative of the New Testament. So the condition of being the Christ, the Messiah, came upon Yeshua, who was presumably a mortal human being like the rest of us. And at that moment, Jesus and Christ united and there you have the Messiah of the Apostle Paul, who invented that entity, who invented that narrative, or worked with those at the time who wrote the New Testament and invented that narrative. So much for the identity of Christ as you can look back in time and look at the origins, and it's not that difficult. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes or Columbo to work this out. However, the formula of identity, which I'm calling the divine human hybrid, the Savior, the Messiah, it didn't just end there, did it? <laughs> no, that's just where it all began. That's just where all the trouble began. What happened over time was that through indoctrination, the Pauline doctrine of the divine savior of mankind went into the world and it was propagated as a religious belief system, a religious ideology. And that took many, many centuries. And there was a lot of resistance to it, particularly coming from the Gnostics. But not only that, coming from a lot of other pagan European peoples who didn't particularly go for that idea. They didn't see anything in it that they needed or anything they needed to believe in contained in that identity. But nevertheless, it was propagated. It was, as I argue, implanted in the human psyche as malware. And over time, that malware developed, the primary algorithm developed and grew 
into various iterations and variations. And so it came about, when you reach the 20th or 21st century, that the identity of Christ operates in the human psyche as a key to human identity. And that application of the formula of identity was present from the beginning, but it took a long time to morph into what it is today. You see, there are Christians of all kinds of denominations, and there are even people who are not Christians who look upon the identity of Christ as something that points to their own inner identity. And they see a mirroring. So they see in Christ perfect innocence, perfect goodness, and the spark of a divinity. And then in turn, they see in themselves what is called the Christ within. And so they identify with Christ as a representative of humanity. That, by the way, is the exact quote that was frequently used by Rudolf Steiner. He defined Christ as a representative of humanity. So if you consider yourself to be a member of the human species, then you might identify in some way with Christ. Of course, you don't identify with the alleged original historical being, but you take that identity as a mirror of your own identity. Another variation of this trope, this meme, is Christ consciousness. Now, there are people who are not Christians as such. They may have no interest whatsoever in the Christian religion, but they argue very strongly for the notion of Christ consciousness. Doing so, they take the identity of Christ to represent a seed of divinity in us all, Christ within. So what is Christ within? How would it compare, say, to Superman within or Batman within? If you can have Christ within, can you have these other fictional identities within yourself, which in some way show you truly who you are? Those who are fond of this concept of Christ consciousness often point out that the word Christ is simply a term that's interchangeable with other terms such as Buddha or Krishna or the Sanskrit word Atman, meaning the self. So you have the Christ, Buddha, Atman in yourself and it is believed to be the very foundation of yourself. So there is a higher self. There is a divine self, according to certain metaphysical propositions, which I entirely reject. And you identify that through these terms, Christ, Buddha, Atman. And what's the takeaway, my friends? Takeaway is a belief, a conviction, that in your innermost self, you are God, or identical with God. It's a God complex. Do you enjoy that God complex? Do you like that idea? Does it give you a kick? Does it give you pleasure to think that we are gods and the main reason why we're here, the meaning of life and the purpose of life is to discover that we are gods? Do you enjoy that proposition? Well, that is the proposition that develops on the formula of identity based on Christ or the Christ within. 
Now, as a Gnostic, I can tell you that I consider that conception of oneself to be totally ridiculous and delusional. It's really easy to conceive or believe or imagine things about yourself. But then how do you prove that those things are true? For instance, if you embrace the idea that you have Christ within, making you identical with God, and you recognize the Christ within others, then how do you behave toward others? Consistent with that belief, and that's all it is, is a belief. You see, the Gnostic view, what stands against that, which is the view I hold, is quite simple. You can believe anything you want about your innate divine identity, but how can you prove it? How do you act? Do you go around radiating love to everyone else and recognizing in them when you look in their eyes that they have in themselves the same presence of divinity that you have in yourself? Do you really do that? How's that working out for you? I'd really like to know how's that working out for you. See, the Gnostics taught, as I do, that there is a spark of divinity in human nature. They called it nous, and that translates as intelligence. So according to the Gnostic view of the human condition, what is divine about you is not your identity. It's not your subjective sense of who or what you think you are. It's a faculty. It's your intelligence. And that you can prove. You can prove how intelligent you are. But you cannot prove by any action that you perform how divine you are. That is one aspect of the deceit of Christ. I see that I've run to half an hour so far, and I've only tackled one of the formulas that I defined at the beginning. So let's say I'll break it off here, and I'll pick up the second aspect of the deceit of Christ, which is the formula of ideology in a follow-up talk. And I think I'll call that talk the evil of universality. Enough said, and I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.